Since you've spent so much time thinking on this subject of of the bills and who introduces them, you know I think there's and I'm not familiar with the literature and, and maybe you can enlighten us, but um, you know there's probably different theories about when the threshold gets high enough or, or when the interest is high enough that a bill is created, right? And what are the triggers for that? Uh, the issue is small enough that people don't bother with a bill and eventually it gets big enough that a bill is created by someone, right? And so it's, you know, in society or in a small group, it's, it's reached this threshold. And you could probably make an argument that, you know, there should be 10 times as many bills, uh, you know, that are introduced because, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can be changed or improved in the federal government, right? Um, on the other side, you could make an argument that such a, a, a small percentage are approved or make it through the process that there's a lot of junk in there uh, and that maybe a lot of the lawmakers don't even believe in these ideas that they're putting in there. They're just, they're, they're putting it in for a constituency or for uh, optics. So what is your thought on that? Is it, would you like to see a lot more bills, a lot more substantive bills in Congress? Or do you think that there should be fewer bills uh, or is that an area that needs further research? I guess my take on it is uh, throwing a bill in the hopper is pretty low bar. Um, and uh, although there are ideas that don't make it to that stage, we're seeing you know seven to ten thousand bills in a two-year Congress in the House and about that same number in the Senate. Uh, I don't think there are ideas that uh, you know, the public cares a lot about that are that are really neglected uh, along those lines. Where we're interested is, uh, you know, the next stages there. Um, so, you know, somebody starts a, a bill idea, it doesn't get traction. Um, what do they do? Uh, in some cases, they could just abandon it. They could just, you know, put it up in the next Congress and so on. But in other cases, we kind of see this building up of support over time. Bills are introduced again in the next Congress, this time with twice as many co-sponsors. Bills that get a hearing in one Congress are more likely to you know, make it to the floor in the next Congress. Those that pass the House in one Congress more likely to, you know, so uh, you, you describe this as building more and more support. Uh, and I, I guess I wasn't seeing that so much at the, you need a lot of support to get the bill in in the first place. I think it's uh, moving forward from those seven to 10,000 uh, to the 4% that passed Congress. Uh, I think that's where at least uh, I'm interested in a lot of the action moving forward. Yeah, I, I would agree with Craig's perspective on this. I mean, <clears throat> you know, Matthew, when you were asking, do we have enough bills or not enough or whatnot, or maybe there's just things that aren't really going to go anywhere. Um, from my perspective, I'm personally agnostic about this because that speaks to broader questions of representation, I think. Um, and from my perspective, you know, similar to what Craig was saying, I mean, conditional on having a, a good staff, putting together a bill isn't to represent the interests of stakeholders that are presenting their cases to you isn't really the most laborious part of the process in comparison to what happens afterwards. So the extent to which people would want members of Congress and the House and the Senate to be representing stakeholders in the broadest sense, you know, I, I think we'd hope that they'd be introducing legislation in response to people pressing their needs to them. But then what happens next, whether or not they're successful because of the effort they exert or alternatively the issue they're engaging with or their institutional position, um, these are precisely the types of questions that we're interested in studying and trying to learn more about, especially for people that are particularly interested, either members of Congress themselves or alternatively their stakeholders, people who are particularly interested in trying to understand what are the keys to legislative effectiveness. Yeah, and I wonder too whether that might vary quite a bit from issue area to issue area, you know, and whether constituencies, of course, have a stronger voice uh, with the representatives than others. And so that would be an interesting Breakdown. Right. Now that we have those issue area scores, we're engaging in what we're calling our portfolios project. Um, so how much are the is one's portfolio reflective of what we know about their district characteristics, reflective of what they have already a background or expertise on from their prior jobs? or reflective of you know, lobbyists and those who are giving them campaign funds, uh, we'll be able to separate a lot of those out now that we're uh, looking at those specific issues. Right.
So I guess before we move on to some more general questions that I've got, maybe we can talk briefly about the steps after the bill uh, is introduced, right? In committee and then floor and then, you know, all the way through both chambers, the president. So my guess is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, once, you, you know, the lawmaker can control the bill's introduction, uh, each step after that, they have less and less control. Uh, and they become less of a bill, less of a lawmaker than they become a, or maybe that is the definition of a lawmaker, and they become more of a project manager, or they become more of a salesman, uh, and quite different skill sets. And in the same way as an inventor might be a great inventor, but they may not be a very good marketer. Uh, you know, and so I think there's a lot of similarities there. Um, you know, you told, you, you mentioned the committee is a key, a key point and whether you, if you're in the minority, getting through the committee is the, is the biggest death, uh, death area for your bill. Uh, but can you talk more about the next steps and what are the key factors uh, that you've seen um, that allow lawmakers to either get their bills advanced or not? Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on a lot of things, right? Uh, and so one of the reasons why we wanted to go through these different stages is uh, the most effective lawmakers have to come up with good ideas and have to be able to promote them and navigate them and, you know, find ways through the House, through the Senate, uh, and so on. Um, and that's a rare commodity that you're good at all of those stages. And so, yes, definitely you have to rely on others. You know, one thing that we had found um, in our work on bipartisanship, for example, um, attracting a lot of bipartisan co-sponsors uh, is something that seems to help bills. Um, but those people who are really bipartisan aren't introducing any more or less bills. Uh, but the fact that they're reaching out and building those coalitions helps them immensely uh, at later stages, helps them immensely in getting those bills through committees and getting them uh, uh, you know, success uh, on the floor of the House, on the floor of the Senate. That kind of, if we were to break down these different stages in our, in our data analysis and see, well, how well can we explain them by all of these factors that we've been talking about, the one that we are <laughs> least able to explain uh, is, you know, from that stage of something passing your home chamber to it going out and becoming law. In other words, uh, you know, building bicameral coalitions. Uh, I think there might be something there. Uh, we just haven't been able to track it down yet. Uh, and so uh, kind of thinking through, you know, you spend so much time and effort coming up with an idea and building the coalitions in your home chamber, and then it goes over to the other chamber and who knows what's gonna happen over there. Um, some members are really good at, you know, okay, uh, I'm the House member and I'm gonna have good relations with my senators and let's make sure that we coordinate and what our efforts are, uh, some much less so. Uh, but I think that's an area for, very ripe for future research. Yeah, I would think that would have a good, a nice tie probably by state uh, or by caucus or by, you know, whether they're, whether that member is close to the leadership uh, or not, since the leadership in theory yeah. should be, um, you know, providing a lot of that kind of project management role, right, to move yeah. it through. So. I mean, this is, uh, you had mentioned the, the, the joys of doing quantitative work. This is one where I think the qualitative work comes in, and complements very well. Uh, you know, from my perspective, it's that combination of, well, you know, Let's talk to some people and find out what's going on there. Uh, we just did an interview uh, up on our website with Don Young uh, of Alaska, and he was telling us, you know, a couple things that he does to make sure his bills don't die when they move to the Senate. Uh, one is he tries not to be partisan at all, so he'll talk about district interests and so on, but he, but you know, not making it a Republican bill such that it would die in the other chamber if it, you know, that's you know held by Democrats and so on. Uh, and the second is just kind of tightly working with the senators, and he he felt that he could do that uh, in Alaska since you know kind of he's a senator type of <laughs> a person being the only representative there, whereas uh, somebody who's uh, from a really split delegation, Pennsylvania or something. Uh, you know, it's tough to coordinate uh, with your senators and, and, and get a single voice there. Great. Well, I'm going to move on to some general questions, uh, if you're ready for those. Uh, sure. Not specific to your research, but relevant to Congress. Uh, so my first one is, and I'll ask this of each one of you, um, what do you think congressional representation should mean? So Craig, why don't we start with you? All right. 
Um, so I see representation as being really multifaceted. Um, one thing that people have studied in the past uh, is uh, if your constituency is really liberal, do you vote in a really liberal manner? Uh, or if they're caring immensely about ethanol policy, do you support them on those sorts of issues? And without a doubt, that's representation. Uh, but the thing that I'm focused on and that the center is focused on is representation uh, means doing not just voting when an issue comes up, but shaping that agenda. Uh, and so working effectively uh, to put ideas out there on behalf of one's constituency. Um, so I would say maybe a poorer representative is somebody who doesn't work on these issues or doesn't move their bills uh, through the process. Uh, and likewise, uh, somebody who uh, moves bills through the process that has nothing to do with uh, what the American public on the whole or, uh, or with their constituents in particular uh, are most interested in. So if I can dig a little bit deeper on that, you mentioned on the one side, you talked about beliefs of, your, of the district. And then later on, you talked about the... Um, the interests of the district. So are you more of a beliefs, you know, the, should the representative reflect the beliefs of their district as they stand at any given time or that they should be, you know, thinking about the long-term interest of that district and making judgments uh, based on what they think those long-term interests should be? Um, I tend to be a big, big fan of expertise, uh, and uh, ideally then members of Congress would uh, get to know that policy area, get to know what's best for their district, uh, and behave in that manner uh, in a way that uh, constituents just don't have the time to, uh, to figure that out. Now, members of Congress don't have the time to figure it out uh, as well in a variety of issues, and so how can they best move forward is, is really the crux of, of some of these uh, questions before Congress today. So it sounds like you're a, you believe in expertise and you believe in the representative as making his own judgments on the interests of the district. I would like to hope that we would get to a position where they would be able to do that. That's right. Great. Alan, same, same question to you. I have a lot of overlap with Craig's perspectives, uh, especially this latter one, because truthfully, from my perspective, I've always thought the only distinction between what you're identifying as beliefs and interests is just a time horizon, a, a time horizon of information, in the sense that if people were generally well informed about the consequences of their choices, then what they believe would actually be the, what we think of as their quote unquote best interests. Um, so as a result, if it's the case that members of Congress, House and Senate are just generically better informed about the consequences of their choices and how it's going to relate to the districts, my view on this is them taking or making choices that are consistent with their expertise by definition is making or they're making choices that are consistent with the beliefs and interests of their district, even though it might not be apparent at that point in time. But if their constituents actually were in the same position as the representatives who are hopefully better informed than them, they'd be advocating for these same courses of action. Um, likewise, similar to Craig, I think representation is multifaceted. I think I would agree with everything that Craig said, but I'd also like to push it even one degree further to say that I'm also cognizant of the fact that I don't think it's the case that all constituents necessarily want their representatives or senators to engage in lawmaking the way we described it. So I don't think either of us would ever suggest that members of Congress who aren't you know, quote unquote, effective lawmakers on our metric are poor representatives of their constituencies. I think people get elected to Congress for many different reasons, including, you know, just having a presence or a seat at the table and being able to articulate their voices in such a way to ensure that their views are being heard and ultimately incorporated into legislation or at least into the discussion in some way. Um, I think that's particularly important for historically underrepresented groups. Um, what I would say, which is quite important, is I would hope that members of Congress, or the, both the House and the Senate, when they're presenting themselves to voters, they're very transparent about the things that they plan on doing when they're in Congress, such that when people are voting for them, they're aware of what their expectations are or should be. And then it's a case that upon being elected, people are true to the way in which they said they were going to be engaging in certain types of activities in Congress. And from my perspective, if they're doing that, then really regardless of their day-to-day -day activities, they're serving the representational needs of their constituencies. Great, all right. So next one is, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? You wanna lead on that one, Alan? 
<laughs> uh, you know, from my perspective, I think I'd pick it up again where Craig started the discussion and that's saying that I put a pretty high premium on the value of expertise and information. So I think it'd be incredibly constructive for members of Congress, um, either in terms of their day-to-day -day activities or alternatively devoting resources towards other institutions that could facilitate the creation of expertise such that people are as well-informed as possible about the relevant needs of their constituencies at the times in which they're formulating policies or likewise the times they vote for policies. So I think in general, um, institutional reforms that could contribute to the cultivation of expertise or information in the broadest sense are things I think would be very helpful for Congress. So if I had to, you know, uh, push a little further on percentage time allocated to what kind of activity. So obviously lawmaking is, is one that you've studied the most, but you know, congressional uh, congressmen do a lot, and, and senators do a lot of work that's constituent service related, that's oversight related, that's fundraising related. You know, can you, you know, obviously, how much? If I could ask it a different way, what percentage of their time should they spend on lawmaking versus uh, some of the other aspects I just mentioned? Craig, I'll turn that to you, my friend. <laughs> So my answer on this whole thing is a little different. Uh, some members are going to be very interested in lawmaking. Some are very interested in oversight and so on. And so for me, the key word is balance. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be in a position where uh, my job has me teaching in areas that I do research in and engaging with members of Congress or the media in areas that I do research on. And so I feel like I have that, that level of balance where uh, everything is coming together uh, on the same issues that I, I'm very interested in. Members of Congress should find that balance and they have to find it for themselves. So if you're really interested in lawmaking, uh, it doesn't mean spend 100% of your time on lawmaking. It means when you're doing oversight, do oversight with an eye, eye towards, well, how's that going to help us uh, in formulating our legislation? When you're doing constituency service, wh what do my constituents, what are they interested in and, and how can I formulate a better law based on that? Uh, when you're engaged in fundraising, uh, it's not just an ask for money, it's at the same time trying to figure out, you know, what are the goals of these folks that I'm talking to? Uh, where are our laws uh, possibly improved uh, along those lines? Uh, and the really effective lawmakers do this all the time. They just see this overlap. They introduce bills that are a combination of their own expertise, their committee assignments and their district characteristics. They just find that balance. Um, and I'd be hopeful that, you know, despite the fact that members of Congress are going to be very different in what they're trying to achieve, that with those goals, they can find that balance for themselves. So sounds like your answer is for each lawmaker or each uh, representative, it would be a different percentage allocated Probably to so. lawmaking versus oversight versus something else. Probably so. All right. Uh, next question is, now, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? So we didn't talk much about this, you know, as as part of your work, uh, but obviously Congress is, at least it was intended to be a place where ideas weren't just introduced, they were discussed. Uh, and, and that discussion would lead to more information of higher value. So how much, how should that process take place? Since it doesn't seem to be really taking place today. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this first. Um, that idea of debate, deliberation, dialogue is essential to good lawmaking, uh, in my view. Um, and so to the extent that it's not existing or not existing at the level that we're interested in, um, you know, that's deeply problematic for, for the functioning of Congress. Um, why it matters is a, a bill in a winner-take-all fashion uh, might be good for one party or for one, uh, you know, one immediate goal, but it's not good for for the long term. Um, and uh, you know, there are a lot of instances where somebody comes up with a great idea, and it's their strongest opponent that helps refine that idea in, into what's what's good policy long term. I think de debate and deliberation in Congress should be mainly done in committees and subcommittees, a lot more than it is uh, thus far. Um, and, uh, and so those processes that strengthen committees and subcommittees um, uh, would, would be beneficial along those lines. Um, 
much of that debate shouldn't be for show, shouldn't be in public. Uh, we've done some work that sh says that the show horses and versus work horses <clears throat> dynamic is still well alive uh, and it's taking place on uh, you know, cable news networks uh, and so on. And that's not uh, really the true dialogue and expertise and deliberation that we need uh, for lawmaking in Congress. Great, so it sounds like it should happen at the committee and subcommittee level and potentially without the cameras on. Uh, that's the way I would see it, but simultaneously to get us there, uh, we need the other sources of power, like uh, <laughs> those who are interested in, in the show horse uh, approach or the party leaders uh, to give up some of the power uh, that they have thus far. And so uh, skeptical on that being a, a reform idea that's, that's likely to work immediately. Right. Alan? Yeah, I, I think I'd just reemphasize or emphasize a point that Craig was raising, and that being that, you know, even though we might have these classic images of members of the House debating policy or really nuanced aspects of policy on the floor of the chamber, um, <clears throat> I'm just really not sure how constructive that is if none of these members are specialists or have the necessary expertise. But one of the reasons why we have this division of labor in both the House and the Senate in terms of committees and subcommittees is to match in, individual members with their and their own expertise with particular policy areas, or alternatively give them incentives to cultivate that expertise so they could hopefully rise to leadership positions in these committees. Um, all of which is to say that by construction, we have these subgroups of legislators who are hopefully either experts or cultivating expertise that could help facilitate meaningful policy debate. And I would, you know, hope or yearn for a reinvigoration of policy debate at the committee and subcommittee level so that when these bills are being cultivated, people are better informed about both the need for said legislation as well as the likely consequences of it. Uh, one area that I'd point to that uh, maybe has a greater possibility of moving forward are a variety of caucuses, right? So these are opportunities for members with similar interests to get together and compare ideas. And some of those are bipartisan, which we appreciate. Uh, some are, are not. Um, but even those that are not, uh, we've, we've studied kind of these ideological factions or caucuses uh, in Congress, and, and, and those tend to serve a role. Uh, we find that they serve a role, particularly for members of the minority party, to keep it engaged and interested in the, in the lawmaking process. Um, but that might be an, another source where we can get some of that uh, dialogue and expertise built up. Right. So next question is, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Go on ahead, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I mean, you know, just to keep on hitting on a common theme in our work, uh, you know, we have reason, I mean, lawmaking in the broadest sense is a labor intensive process. Members of Congress have increasingly scarce amounts of time with which to balance their competing needs of the day or the week or the month, so to speak. So from my perspective, any institutional reforms that could uh, facilitate the cultivation of expertise or the resources that, or the creation of resources that would help members of Congress learn more about what they're voting on, learn more about the needs for said legislation, likely consequences of this legislation, as well as possibly influencing the ways in which members of Congress spend their work day. And by that, I mean the amount of time they actually spend in Washington, D.C., uh, possibly cultivating relations both with members of their own party as well as members of the other party. Uh, could presumably go a long way towards cultivating an effective lawmaking environment. I mean, a common theme that we hear, I mean, we can both read about in biographies or congressional histories, but something that Craig and I have both heard firsthand from members of Congress who are still in the House, who've been in the House since the 70s and 80s, as well as those who had served previously, was the fact that we all know the day-to-day -day life of a member of Congress changed pretty significantly in the mid-1990s when members of the House in particular no longer moved their families out to Washington, D.C., and they'd head back to the district, you know, essentially on Thursday evening in most cases and come back on Monday or Tuesday, depending on the member. Um, and practically speaking, when you compress the face-to-face -face work week into a relatively short period of time, under the best circumstances, this just is going to limit the opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction with cultivation of meaningful work relationships with people that are outside your normal sphere. And many members of Congress, both current and past, speak to the ways um, in which this really led to um, the degradation of the quality of the lawmaking process, so to speak, largely just because people had really never cultivated any meaningful relationships without that. <laughs> we obviously talk about the ways in which trust can't be built up over time, but independent of that, people just aren't able to really 
assess the scope of the comparative skills and expertise across the chambers with which people might want to try to build bridges with people who have better expertise than them on these issues. Um, so once again, we're in a situation in which in contemporary times, uh, members of the House and Senate might not really be able to uh, take advantage of some of their most valuable resources, not being other members of the chamber, because they're not put in positions that they can facilitate these meaningful relationships. So you would add more time in Washington? Um, I would be amenable to that reform or alternatively ways in which we could also cultivate relationships, perhaps outside of Washington as well. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that, um, and I say this not basing this on large sample data analysis, this is just observation. Um, the work of a member of Congress is notably more complicated now than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, we as a society and members of Congress in particular, I don't think are suffering for lack of information because the ease, the ease with which a member of Congress can acquire information about a wide array of topics, both relevant to their own legislation now, as well as potential pieces of legislation is incredible compared to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But as the ease of information acquisition has skyrocketed, um, we've obviously become plagued by poverty of attention. Um, people are being pulled in so many different directions. There's questions as to how you prioritize such information and definitely building on some of our work and this is emphasized by other people and follows from other large sample empirical studies. Um, we've also essentially seen a hollowing out of staff in this time. So, you know, members of Congress in the broadest sense are being spread incredibly thin. So anything we could do to help reinforce our efforts to engage in the lawmaking process, including cultivating face-to-face -face or virtual face-to-face -face relationships, part of me would be helpful. Great. Craig? Um, yeah, so, you know, we see lots and lots of proposals to reform or improve Congress. And, you know, the, there are a couple broad branches of that that I tend to be skeptical on. One is uh, where, hey, that sounds good, but the people who are in power would never let that happen, right? So we want to be kind of dismissive of those. And the second is, Congress used to be great. Let's get it back to the way that it was. Uh, again, not acknowledging that a lot has changed over time. Uh, so the ones that I'm kind of moved toward at this point are information age uh, solutions. You know, the fact that um, we can reform Congress in ways uh, just by providing good information to the right people at the right time. Uh, and part of the reason why we're so excited about our effective lawmaking work uh, is, you know, to the extent that voters want to know who's an effective lawmaker um, and want to know objectively, uh, that information is, uh, is available uh, now. To the extent that, um, you know, a staffer is thinking about uh, applying for a job and who do I want to work for, uh, or a small interest group that doesn't know uh, the congressional community very well uh, is finding out, you know, who, who's taking a lead in transportation policy, who's taking a lead in health policy at this point in time. Uh, maybe I could work for them or with them, uh, again, making that information available. Um, so, um, you know, it's not going to solve everything. And as we've seen with uh, a lot of social media, uh, too much information or biased information, uh, you know, is, is problematic. Uh, and thus, uh, we need uh, some degree of nonpartisan institutions, some degree of uh, experts and, and, and comparative uh, advantage there where, where people are trusting uh, on both sides of the aisle, uh, from very liberal to very conservative, uh, and where we take their considerations uh, into account. Uh, I think uh, that level of expertise and information, uh, you know, there's talks about bringing back the Office of Technology Assessment uh, or strengthening CRS, um, giving more more resources to legislative council. Uh, you know, all of that are, are in the information uh, building up expertise approaches, and, and those are the ones that I'm drawn for. Great. What book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Uh, I was going to throw out two here. Uh, one is uh, just something that uh, both Alan and I were very familiar with uh, in, in graduate school, Keith Crable's Information and Legislative Organization, um, really a book that shows how you can combine uh, some of those interests that I had, the game theoretic approaches, the empirical analysis, uh, and shows the importance of uh, information and expertise in Congress, so the types of things we were talking about uh, at that point in time. Uh, and the other one I would point to is Eric Schickler's Disjointed Pluralism, 
um, where he is basically tracking all of the reforms over the past hundred plus years. Uh, and uh, the, the takeaway there for me is that uh, the coalitions for reforms are changing so much uh, from one reform effort to the next uh, that, you know, even if we have a good idea, unless you have the coalition to get it done, uh, you know, that reform isn't, isn't going to take place. Uh, and those coalitions are changing all the time. Alan? Uh, I, I would second Craig's suggestions. I think those are both important and really well-written books that I value a lot. Um, in addition to that, um, I think a book that doesn't necessarily deal with Congress per se, but does deal with legislative politics, which definitely has informed my perspective of how to engage in some of the work we do right now, is Thad Couser's book on term limits and the, dismantl the dismantling of state legislative professionalism, um, in which uh, Thad you know, essentially is trying to understand what are the consequences of uh, legislative term limits in the broadest sense which is a very important question for trying to understand many aspects of the design of legislative institutions and the efficacy of representative democracy. And in the United States, of course, if we're thinking about this at the congressional level, this obviously was a hot button issue in the 90s, but we simply don't have term limits for members of the House and Senate. But if we think about what has occurred in the state legislatures, there's quite a bit of variance in terms of those states that do or don't have term limits when they were phased in and the like. And by engaging in a theoretically motivated large sample empirical analysis, that is able to provide us with some insights and potentially some guidance or potentially some guidance about the institutional consequences of tweaking with the institutions themselves. Um, and when I think about many of the questions that Craig and I are trying to engage with at the congressional level, this is very much the way in which we're trying to approach this research, um, come up with a very well articulated and clear question regarding what are the consequences of X, and then try to turn to a rigorous uh, large sample analysis of the data to provide us with guidance on our question. And in many cases, as we found now, especially as our efforts have moved to understanding lawmaking effectiveness in state legislatures, we're actually in a position where we could think about the lessons that could be drawn from our analysis of state legislatures to provide us with guidance about what the likely consequences might be of tweaking with different forms of institutions at the congressional level. So for all those different reasons, I think that, that book is very useful in informing my thinking. Right, well, why don't we complete, you know, conclude here with uh, just broadly speaking, and we've touched on it a bit already, but where do you wanna take the research? You know, your next 10 years or so, uh, you know, where, do, where, what questions do you think are important to, to look at for your own work and for others? And, and where do you see your career kind of moving forward from here? So Craig, why don't we go back to you? Right. Uh, so I'm very enthusiastic about this uh, legislative effectiveness work uh, and uh, hoping to continue with that uh, for a decade and beyond. Um, and within that, uh, the three that I'm most excited about are continuing our Building a Better Congress project that Alan was describing with the work on identification, cultivation and accountability. Uh, the second is as we're turning to more issue area scores, kind of our portfolios project uh, and seeing you know, which members introduce in which areas and why. Uh, and then the third is our, our work turning to state legislatures where, uh, as Alan was just talking, um, you know, we're scoring every state legislator over the past 20 years uh, and able to find those legislative bodies that uh, through luck of their institutional design or through conscious choice have found things that work really well. And, you know, we'd be interested in seeing whether those could spread elsewhere or spread to Congress uh, and beyond. Great. Alan? And obviously, I'm in a very similar position to Craig. I mean, we're both drawn to this project in the broadest sense, and I expect and hope that we're both going to be working on it really for the duration of our careers in different aspects of it. Um, I think one broad goal that I also have in addition to engaging in these specific research points that Craig was, was raising is hopefully to continue to cultivate a, a cohort of scholars that are also drawn to these questions as well. Um, in the broadest sense, I think it's fair to argue that Congress is a very important lawmaking institution. I'm hoping I'm not going out on a limb and saying that. Um, but even though many of us know quite a bit about some of the formal rules and processes, um, really where the rubber hits the road, there's still so many questions that all of us have in terms of how it functions. And likewise, what is potentially possible or perhaps less possible by people that want to advance their initiatives and goals to the legislative process. And Congress is also a very interesting body. I mean, it's a decision-making institution where you have 435 individuals. Um, no one is basically the boss where the rubber hits the road. The extent to which everyone interacts with each other is entirely based on uh, willingness and volunteerism and consensus or lack thereof at times. 
And given that they face these relatively unique incentives compared to almost any other work environment you could think of, uh, it raises some very interesting questions to me in terms of how the day-to-day -day process of lawmaking occurs and likewise how preferences of the mass public or alternatively interested stakeholders can be translated into policy. And I think we have some broad insights, to some aspects of those questions, but many others just haven't really been studied for years. And we have a great cohort of scholars of all different ranks that are interested in these questions now. We're also blessed with just having technology and access to data sources that we just simply have never had at this point with which to try to engage with these questions. Well, it's great work and, uh, you know, really looking forward to the next steps uh, and, and digging deeper into the state side of things and also looking further at the at the national level. So appreciate, you know, you joining me today and uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks for highlighting our work. Thanks a ton, Matthew.